Okay, Stacy, how can I get my board to use the resources we develop? My staff who works on our marketing, communications, and development materials have come up with great messaging documents, stories, and executive summaries of various programs we need to fundraise for. I provide this to my board and have done so repeatedly when someone mentions needing something to distribute to their friends. For some reason, this isn't sticking. Board members continue to ask me for these resources, or they just go rogue and use their own messages to friends without referring to the resources I've vetted and approved for use. What can I do to shift this frustrating dynamic and save all of us some time? Oh, that is such, so annoying. And <laughs> I, I'm i sure you've seen this, Andy. Like every board meeting, every executive director I've ever worked with has said, oh my gosh, they like, you know, you get the board member who says, could you just, it would be so, I would do it if you would just get me this or right. Like right. it's, it's like, and then you just see the executive director's head exploding because they're <laughs> like, uh, I've been doing that for three years. Like anyway, whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah, like, oh, this makes my blood curdle because it just stinks. Um, and it's such a waste of time, but You know, this is where I say, executive director, enlist your board chair. When you're having your monthly communications or however often you're communicating with your board chair, talk to them and say, hey, like, this is a pain point and there's only so much like I can continue to do and my staff can continue to do and have it fall on deaf ears. So like, will you either remind people I mean, and the ED could remind them too, right? But like, obviously the reminders are not helping or like someone's forgetting. So, so like, I think it gives the board chair an opportunity to say, hey, like when someone asks for that, we actually have that system in place and, um, but, but let's open this up for some discussion is, is like, like. A, like, what? why are you not using, like, why is this not being used? Because we hear of a, right? Like, there's the question. Yeah. Because, because maybe it's something really simple, like, that could be changed. Um, But that also requires monitoring, because I've also seen that go rogue, where then someone said, like, every board member says, well, I need to be communicated with in a different way. I need you to text me it. I need you to email it to me. I need you to put it in this, like my share, like a shared Google drive, like whatever, like Google share, like it's like, okay, head exploding. And so, so kind of having that like uniform, like discussion about what will work for the larger board and what can they agree to and use and like start flipping using it. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I think you've got a really good point is the, you have to ask why they're not using what you've provided because it may it may be really great but it's all written in third person and the way this donor wants to communicate with their friends is as an email and it needs to be way breezier and it needs to be in first person instead of third and so so they're asking you for something very specific and they may you know you may say we've done all this already but there might be something that you haven't provided that a particular donor wants to use so I would, you know, exactly what you just said is like, find out why they're not using it. You know, like it could be something like, you know, they're just, they're just technically not capable of using Dropbox. That's just too hard <laughs> or something like yeah, that, or, or, yeah. or they don't know where to get it or, you know, it was provided on paper and they don't want to retype it in. Like what, what the issue is. And, and maybe you'll get some better answers for that. But yeah, that's aside from just not knowing that it exists again, like we talk about it every board meeting, we show you where it is. It's part of the board packet. The email address (laughs) is right here, whatever it is, it's right there for you. And they just can't be bothered. Um, There may be some other reason. I feel like simplicity is key here because a lot of the boards I work with and that like, like simplicity, we've got to figure out how do we make things easier and not harder. And so I think there's this tendency sometimes that we solve problems like this by giving more information, more data, like, and that actually complicates it and is really overwhelming. So as a board member, you're like, oh my gosh, now I have 10 handouts. (laughs) Which do I use (laughs) for what? Right? Like, I mean, seriously. And so I think we have to put ourselves a little bit in their shoes. And I also think some sort of organizing system, whether that's like an online board portal. But I will tell you, I also know online board portals. It's funny. I like, I'm sure there's more progressive modern boards than the ones I've worked with, but many boards like even resist that because they're like another password, Mm -hmm. another thing I have to go into, like... (laughs) 
It's like the last thing I have time for. I, so, so I do think having this conversation is so important because it's it's not just for these materials. It's kind of for everything the organization is doing and everything the executive director is sharing. Like, is it just too much? Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Everything. I'm Andy Shurick. I'm here with my fantastic co-host, Stacy Wedding, and we're here to answer whatever random questions you have to send us, um, preferably about nonprofit stuff, because those are going to be the most interesting answers. Um, I guess you can send us other stuff. We would answer them probably. Um, but this is a production of the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. Uh, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits is the state association for nonprofits in Nevada. If you're not a member, go check them out. It's actually the best way to support the podcast is to become an AN member. The second best way to support the podcast is to send us questions because if you don't send us questions, we don't have anything to answer. And as we've threatened before, we will just talk about our children and pets. <laughs> And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. (laughs) Different funding agencies and each grant application have different requirements. If there are any standard requirements across all or most federal applications, can you outline what those are? (laughs) I think a a guest expert can. (laughs) 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 That's a perfect, perfect example of things that, (laughs) things that we want other help on, right? Yes, I agree. Certainly not my, uh, you know, there's traditional grant applications that we know have all your standard stuff, but, but I don't, I don't know enough, right? About some of the, you know, the federal applications and what are consistencies. So it's a great question, especially given some of our recent Um, podcast episodes with Miles from Nevada Grant Lab and just some of the, I know, federal money coming down. I think this is on everyone's mind. So uh, let's, let's find a guest expert, Andy. Hey, everybody. We have a guest expert with us today to answer a a question that I think is probably on the minds of many these days with uh, all the things we keep hearing about government funding. So I know this is a hot topic right now, and we have a hot tamale guest. So uh, welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So happy to be here with you today. Yes, it's great to have you. So I I will just share that Lisa Ruiz Lee is uh, just kind of an expert in so many things and uh, has had a lot of lot of different experiences and background serving the nonprofit sector, working with with a lot of government agencies, making collaborations and connections for everyone, and just using her expertise to to help make everyone stronger. And she she just does does it with a lot of grace and humility. And it's been my pleasure to uh, know Lisa for quite some time and and was so excited she was willing and able to be our guest expert today. So Lisa, do you want to share a little bit more about yourself for our listeners? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I started my career in public service and worked for local government for Clark County in Nevada for about 20 years and ended my career there as the director of Nevada's largest child welfare agency. And from there, I decided that I really wanted to make a difference in my community working with nonprofits. I had had such a great opportunity to see the tremendous work that they do while I was working in local government and knew that my skills could really bolster the work that they do, which would improve the community for everyone. So I spend part of my time today working with nonprofits in the Nevada community, but I also spend a large part of my time working for Action for Child Protection, which is a national nonprofit that specializes in child welfare. Yes. You ever want to know something about child welfare? This is your go-to woman. So uh, anyways, thank you, Lisa, again, for being with us. So I'm going to get us kicked off with a question we got from one of our listeners, and we will just dive right in. Different funding agencies and each grant application have different requirements. 
if there are any standard requirements across all or most federal applications, can you outline what those are? Lisa, that, that is a great question. And, and a lot of the nonprofits that I work with here have asked that question as, as well. And I would love to tell you the answer is yes, <laughs> the applications are all the same, because certainly that would make everyone's lives much easier. But the reality is, is that they're not. They're all completely different. They have components that overlap that are similar in nature, but you'll never find two applications coming from two different agencies that are the same. So the best advice that I can give nonprofits is to prepare yourselves to deal with the nuances um, and to start to pull your story together so that you can break it apart as the various elements are needed, depending upon what the applications are asking for. So... It's interesting to hear you talk about the story, and I would love for you to elaborate because I will I will share that I I know many nonprofits hear that advice with individual donors, with private funder grant opportunities, and I think there is a, a sense or a mindset that that is not at all what you need to be doing in government grant applications because particularly federal, but but any of them for that matter, because it's all about facts. You don't need a story. You don't need anything compelling. So can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? So I think the important thing when you're dealing with government grant applications is to find creative ways to interweave the story of your organization, your mission, your vision, your values, your service delivery, and combine that with the facts of the work that you do so that you can address appropriately how you are working towards solving a problem or addressing a community-wide need. And so when I say tell your story, that's really what I'm saying is what is important about the work that you do and how you do it, how do you make a difference, but come to the table with evidence of that, be able to tell them the work that you're doing and to quantify the outcomes that you achieve. And there's a lot of other components to that as well. I mean, when we think about our story as a nonprofit, sometimes we don't think about the expertise that we have and bring to the table. So part of your story is your internal capacity. So what does your resumes look like for your staff and your employees? Do you have biographies pulled together that you are prepared to share? What do we know about your administrative structures? What do you know about your administrative structures that allows you to document how their sufficiency will allow you to manage government funds? All of that is part of your story. How do you document your outcomes? How many people are you serving? When you serve them, what are you achieving? So thinking concretely about the ways in which that you deliver services and making sure to wrap those into the application as you can. Is it a fair assumption that it should be less touchy-feely and more... Um, everything you said could be done in two ways, right? Or multiple ways, but you could have a very soft touch side to it that's much more uh, qualitative, much more anecdotal, and then you could have a much more, uh, you know, it, it just facts-based, here's, here's the facts, right? Like, we've done this, we have this expertise, we have these outcomes. So have you seen a, a mix or a blend that tends to work well? Um, or Or is that just kind of a misconception that you shouldn't you shouldn't have anything touchy feely in a government grant application <laughs> i i think that touchy feely actually is appealing to a lot of folks who are reviewing government grant applications so you always have to put try to put yourself in the reviewer's seat, like what is it that they're looking for? We know that they have very hard and fast matrices that they use when they assess those applications. They're looking for very specific things. And they always tell you what those things are in their notice of funding awards. So you have to be mindful of what's in that document as you write your application. But I think there is a way to create the balance where you are also integrating the touchy-feely. So some applications that I've seen that have worked really well are applications that include feedback directly from clients based upon the services that they've received. 
you always have space limitations. So you're juggling how many facts you can include and how much touchy feely you can include and how many words you're using or characters in some cases, and you never have enough space. I know that having written many, many government grant applications. But what I will say is that you want them to understand why your work matters. And if the best way to do that is to share those anecdotes or to share those responses from people who've received your services, I would say find a way to incorporate that because you're appealing to your reviewers and you're also telling the story of why your work matters. Great, great advice. And I, for someone who is starting out with government grants, does does it make a difference? Would you provide any counsel of whether they should start very much local, you know, a city-based grant or county-based grant versus state versus federal? Perhaps you can give our listeners a little bit of, I don't know, a, a, a preview, an overview of what, what they would expect from those different types of government grant opportunities? Yes. So I think, um, I think that's a really good question. And what I will say is, especially in today's universe, that there are, there are some similarities in terms of the requirements across government applications and the kinds of basic things that they're looking for especially for smaller nonprofits, I always tell them to be be mindful that they have the ability and the capacity to manage those dollars. So some of the things that you can look for on applications, whether you're talking about a city application or a county application or a state or a federal, is typically they have requirements that have to be met that they refer to as attestations. And so what you want to do is review those attestations. What are they asking you as a nonprofit to commit to and to promise to them that you can do? There will be components of those attestations that may address everything from your financial system and structure to your checks and balances and your accountability policy and procedures that are related to money to your ability to manage personal identifiable information, PII and confidentiality and HIPAA and all of those important things in the receipt of those dollars. So take a look at the attestations, know what you're agreeing to up front with each application. And when you review them, you'll see that there are similarities across them. They're going to ask you for things about your board. And what does your board engagement look like? What does your meeting structure look like? Can they have copies of your meeting minutes? Do you have all of those ready to go? They're going to ask you things about your financial and your accounting structure. If you're still living in the day where you're writing checks and sort of keeping it offline as a nonprofit, that's probably not going to work in the government grant universe. So you need to have structure to your financial and accounting systems. They're going to ask about your request for reimbursement processes. How do you currently manage those? How will you manage the new award? One of the things for nonprofits to really think seriously about is whether you have the revenue to support paying for services and being reimbursed for them later. So many times they're not going to grant you a a lump sum of money up front, but they're going to ask you to spend the money and request reimbursement for it on the back end. So they want to know that you can do that. They are going to ask you about your human resources processes and whether or not you do background checks, for example, on volunteers, particularly if you're working in human services or education related Um, functions. So do you do that? And can you document it? Do you maintain your HR files? Can you provide evidence of that? They're going to ask you about payroll and time entry, insurance requirements, your service delivery metrics and your outcomes. How do you measure those? They're going to ask you if you've had a financial audit in the last year or not, and they're going to ask you to provide evidence of that. So have you done that? And can you provide evidence? Those are the kinds of basics that they're going to ask you for as a nonprofit. And so I always tell folks to be prepared and to know that their administrative structure has the capacity of addressing those. Because it's not just the application that you have to worry about. You apply, and that's a lot of work. And then you get awarded, and you're super excited to move forward. And then comes the auditing. (laughs) So you have to brace yourself for the life cycle of an award that starts with an application and usually will end with getting money and delivering amazing services and being audited and providing evidence that you've done what you said you were going to do. Wow. 
I mean, it, it feels like there is no uh, stone left unturned when you're going through this process. Yes, <laughs> that is a very fair statement. Absolutely. <laughs> and I guess I just am, am thinking, do you, you know, it's, it, I think there's this, this struggle right now of organizations because there is a lot of publicity, a lot of news, a lot of hype around all this government funding available. and the administrative systems that need to be in place are clearly a, a, a piece of considering whether an organization should apply as well as the back end of it, as you said. Do you see funders and, and grant funders that have had a poor experience with an applicant? The applicant didn't deliver on, on what they said they would in the grant proposal or didn't meet those auditing requirements. Are there repercussions of that? I mean, obviously there's the evident, right? Like the obvious one of, okay, you're probably not going to get funded again. But I, I'm just curious to know how much government agencies are, are tracking this and able to pull up, oh yeah, this this grantee did a really poor job. So we're not probably going to fund them again. Is, is the door totally shut? Um, I'm giving you about probably three questions wrapped into one. So <laughs> whatever you want to tackle. So I think um, I think that is three questions in one for sure. But mm -hmm. I think that the answer to that question is yes, there are repercussions. And so I think a lot of times, um, you know, that there there is sort of this thought out there that government doesn't hold service providers accountable well. And maybe they don't, but they do hold them accountable in some way, shape, or form. And when it comes to dollars, there are very, they have very steep audit requirements that they have to meet on behalf of the federal government who passes through a lot of this money to them. So the audit sort of rolls downhill, right? The feds will audit the state, the state will audit their service providers, and everybody is accountable to meeting the requirements that they agree to up front. And if the state finds or any any awarder of grant funds finds that the providers that they've funded are not meeting those requirements at any point in time, they have the ability or the option to um, either attempt to recapture those funds or to just simply cease providing them, which can be a big hang up for, for nonprofits who are providing direct services and who are counting on those funds. The other piece of it is keep in mind that I said a lot of these funds are paid for after the fact, not before the fact. So in some cases as a nonprofit, you may have already spent the money and you may need it to pay your bills. And if the state audits and finds that you are non-compliant, they don't have an obligation to give you those funds that you've already spent. So it really can create a financial nightmare for nonprofits. I think the worst case scenario is, is that you have a government agency who says you don't meet the requirements and we're going to note it and you may not ever be eligible for these kinds of funds again. And it does happen and they do talk to one another. That's the other thing. I think a lot of times we bank on the fact perhaps that government agencies don't talk to one another. Sometimes they do and sometimes they communicate really well. So you just want to make sure that you're doing your very best, that you know up front what you're getting into, that you have the capacity to manage it and then that you can deliver. And one other question tied into this and, and the differences between a private philanthropy approach and a government funding approach, relationship building, as we know, is, is oftentimes a cornerstone of private family foundations, corporate foundations, and, and building that relationship and seeing if your nonprofit is a good fit for their interest and their priorities. Is such a thing even, does something like that happen within government? It feels like it's very tough to actually get a human being when you go through a government, <laughs> federal, right. state, any of them. It's, it's, it's tough. Sometimes they'll give, they're nice enough and they'll give you a name, right? Hey, here's a contact. But, but it, it feels that because of all the rigid standards, it feels like it is less about relationship building and more about absolutely what you put in that proposal and what your past performance has been. Is that a fair assumption? 
I think it's a, a very fair assumption. I think that your past, you know, that your that what you put in that application is what they read and it's just literally what they assess and what they grade and rate and what determines how you score and scores determine who gets funded, right? They work their way down from the highest to the bottom of the pot of the money and there you go. Um, and so the application piece of it really matters a lot. But I will also tell you that I don't, I wouldn't want anyone to underestimate the value of relationships, even in the government funding market. So especially for new nonprofits that are just getting started, there are a limited number of project officers who work for the state and the city and the county, and even for the feds, depending upon what agency you're applying for. So you do have an opportunity to get them to get to know them as you receive the awards. And really what you want to do is you, you want to make them your champion. So you want them to see the good work that you're doing and the successes that you're having. And it's not because they're going to be able to give you any preferential treatment going forward, but because you want them to be able to advocate for you. You want them you know, when others are asking for feedback about your performance, they want, you want them to be able to share your success story. And I have found that in the project officers that I've worked with on several of my bigger ticket projects, that that relationship has been really meaningful. It's been meaningful for me. It's, I think it's been meaningful for them. But the other thing that they can do is they can give you some insight too into what's coming. So sometimes it's as simple as, hey, we're going to be releasing another notice, um, a funding opportunity. Have you checked the forecasting lately so you can see what's out there? So sometimes you just get tidbits like that so that you can help to prepare for what's coming down the pipeline. But I, I would say never underestimate the value of relationships no matter what, but also have an understanding that in the government universe, your application score matters. So don't let that slide ever. Even if you've had the same award for the past 50 years and you feel like you're never going to lose it, don't let that application slide because you could. You could score below a cut score and you could lose that 50 year award. But um, also, you know, make good friends, be good partners. And I think that that matters. Well, and that's great in every aspect of running a nonprofit, isn't it? So it sure is. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> be good partners. Exactly. Exactly. Well, before we we wrap it up, are, are there any final words of, of advice that you want to share with our listeners? I think really at this point, it's just about doing good work. Go out and do what you do best. Look for funding. Be creative in your approaches to how you fund your projects. Grow your programs. And mostly just do good work that our community needs. I mean, as we're wherever it is that we are in terms of the COVID pandemic, I don't know if we're at the beginning or the end uh, or the middle anymore. It's never ending. But wherever we are, we know that the services that are provided by nonprofit make a difference in the lives of many, many people. So focus on the services, focus on your story, do good work, and be prepared to share it. Well, this has been invaluable to to me, to our listeners, it is uh, just so refreshing to talk to someone who knows this from the inside out and from all perspectives because you did work in government for a while. So, so you understand it from those different lenses. With that, uh, onward and upward, let's go get some of this money. <laughs> I agree. Let's go get this money. <laughs> great. That's a great way to end this. Thanks for listening and thanks for joining us, Lisa. You're very welcome. You made it. You've crossed the finish line of another episode of Nonprofit Everything. And now, while you have that energy that came from this podcast, I want you to do one thing. I want you to just share it. Share it with one person, one person that you know in your work world, in your life that you think might find this interesting, might find one of the questions you just heard interesting. Just let them know that we exist. Nonprofit Everything is there. We're here to answer their questions or bring in a guest expert who will. So uh, we thank you so much for being our loyal listeners. And uh, the best gift you can give us is asking us questions and sharing this with your friends and colleagues and maybe even your dogs because I love dogs. And hey, the dogs don't talk back. They just might yap back. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Anyways, and and final thanks to Anne, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits, for uh, making this possible. As uh, you know, it's a production of of Anne, and Anne has uh, been on the journey with us since the very beginning. So thank you, and look forward to catching up soon. Mm-hmm.